games, you love hilarious banter, and you are ready for a piece of televised history. But before that, it's Friday, it's quite late in the evening, which means you probably had a kebab and between one or six pints of beer, sir. So you're quite ready for thumb banding. <laughs> Yes, welcome to Thumb Bandits. We're the cure for your midwinter blues. Stay tuned for a look at robotic dogs, weirdo experiments, and we'll be looking at some of your fave games from the home computer era. You love it, you nostalgia sluts. But first, the waiting is over. The man with the porn star name and the dodgy mullet is back. Yes, Ian is taking a look at Solid Snake's latest adventure. Who goes there? Chalashaska. What the? How controversial would it be for me to say that I wasn't that mad on Metal Gear Solid first time around? I can already hear roars of anger from you fervent gamers and frequent masturbators who get upset when I dare question something that you consider to be art. But I got bored and never went back to it. That, to me, isn't a good game. I was expecting Metal Gear Solid 2, Sons of Liberty, to be an Emperor's New Clothes style affair, with everyone calling it a masterpiece, while only I could see that it was hollow, <laughs> naked, and disappointing. Snake, there's something I have to tell you. What? I, uh... I have a younger sister. Imagine my surprise when I played Metal Gear Solid 2 and after 10 minutes I was phoning up my friends telling them this is a masterpiece and you would not believe what's happening in the story. There are so many twists and turns in the plot that it freaked me out more than that bird having a cock in the crying game. That's nothing compared to what happens to Snake in this instalment. In fact, the only thing that slows the story down are the ridiculously long and increasingly irritating codex sections. You remember, this is the two-way walkie-talkie chitty-chat that goes on forever and looks so dull. Flick through them as quickly as possible to ensure they don't fuck up your enjoyment of the game. Graphically, you couldn't ask for much more. Although completely different from the gothic majesty of something like Ico, this is nonetheless almost perfect. The scenery is stunning and the movement of the characters is incredibly realistic. Just hide in a locker and watch those guards through the grill. They look so menacing and move with a degree of intelligence much more noticeable than in the first game. <laughs> the controls are easier than before, and that's a blessing. Despite having more crawling, leaning and fisting moves, Snake is dead simple to manoeuvre, and his shooting is much more accurate this time, thanks to a spot-on first-person firing mode. But be careful. If those sodding guards see your laser sight, then you're in trouble. Because I care for you, despite everything you say, I can't tell you any of the story. It wouldn't be fair, but it is pretty good. And as you know, I'm not really a fan of game plots. I completed it in about 27 minutes. That didn't spoil my enjoyment of the game. Most of the fun comes from hiding around a corner, waiting for a guard so you can jump out and palm him off. Isn't it good to know that with the release of Ico, Devil May Cry and this beauty, the PS2 is finally living up to the hype of two years ago. Welcome to the News Desk, where we bring you snippets of gaming knowledge from around the world. And firstly, it's all going to end in tears, as the console war really kicks off. Nintendo claim they're selling 27 GameCubes a minute, while Microsoft say their Xbox is the biggest selling console in its first two weeks. Either way, it looks like this next-gen rivalry has put the wind up Sony. In an interview for the Financial Times, the president of Sony, Kunitaki Ando, said that they were suffering a major whitey because the Xbox comes with internet connectivity and hard drive out of the box. That is the biggest threat to the PlayStation 2. The Xbox changes the industry's life cycle, which may mean that the PS2 only has a three-year shelf life. By 2004, market experts claim that in North America alone, there'll be 34 million PS2s, 20 million Xboxes, and 18 million GameCubes. However, not wanting to bank on predictions, Sony have already begun research and development of... the PS3. Hallelujah. 
With help from Toshiba, IBM and about $400 million, the PS3. That's got you excited, doesn't it, eh? Hey? As TV stars, Ian and I often like to travel on our personal Learjet, which is, of course, fitted with several gaming consoles and a jacuzzi. But some people are piss poor and have to travel coach, but, like us, want to play games. As it's the holiday booking time of the year, we thought we'd give you our guide to airline gaming. Cathay Pacific were one of the first introduced gaming on planes, but it's only two cheers for them because the games are rubbish. Singapore Airlines does better with 35 Nintendo Game Boy titles loaded into their system. But the Thumb Bandit's highest flyer is Virgin Atlantic. In a fortnight's time, a brand spanking new refit will be completed on all their planes. This means you'll be playing a whole host of licensed Nintendo games, which will be networked so you can play against the crew and passengers. And hey, it's much better fun than worrying about crashing. And that's the Rumour Roundup for this week. Ah! I've got the strongest right arm out of the two of us. Oh, you bastard. Yeah, really, games are great when you can humiliate your opponent and prove that there can be only one winner. Mm, that's right, Alex, but a lot of games come from Japan where no one must be made to feel like a failure and even the most rubbish karaoke singer gets a polite round of applause. Those of you who buy import games may have noticed that there are subtle differences from the UK versions. These differences are due to a process called localization, where games are altered to suit the differing national tastes of gamers across the world. Video games are a huge industry, and making sure that they make that leap from country to country and also appeal to the broadest audience possible has become a precise science. At Aberté University in Dundee, Jim Turkhurst and his team attempt to understand differences in gamers from different nationalities, particularly the Japanese. IC Cave is all about helping games companies develop better games, and it's a place to think about what the future of gaming might be. We have this uh, fancy setup here that gives us controls to four cameras in the observation room. Jim gets UK gamers to play foreign games and then works out what needs to be changed for the games to work in the UK market. At its simplest, that involves changing things like language. But typically, it's more complex. Some genres, for instance, you couldn't sell in the other market. They just wouldn't have any interest. Or if the genre would sell, maybe certain aspects of it are uh, not considered appropriate. Uh, typically, these involve issues like violence and nudity. Games that have been changed by the localization process are the Final Fantasy series, Dead or Alive 2, and Fantavision. But why go to all this trouble? Well, it's a rhetorical question. Don't answer it. It's bloody obvious. Cash, pounds, dollars, lira, yen, groats. Maybe not groats, actually. <laughs> this is gonna be a match to remember. Fight! Japan is really the home and still the center of the computer games industry. It's more than the fact they manufacture the consoles there, though, and have the great developers. Uh, games are an important part of Japanese life. However, some of the games they play are very different from some of those favored in the UK. They like role-playing games. Uh, I think these are popular because Japanese players seem to like to have a reason for why things are happening. Uh, you see that even in their fighting games, where they don't fight because they want to. Uh, if you listen to the, the audio, it usually says that uh, honor demands. <laughs> also, there's a lot of emphasis on skill in Japanese games. That's often why you see all of the statistics at the end of a game or at the end of a level. If you play with your friend at home, it's very difficult to, uh, to beat them because that would be sort of impolite, you know, to thrash your friend at a game. You want to play just about at the same level they do. Well, it takes all sorts, I guess. Vive la difference, I say. I'm gonna kick your ass. Blood and guts, carnage and body parts. No, not a Saturday night in A&E. It's this week's games for our ghoulish jury to play. Words of wisdom will come tonight from Paul, Scott, and Jackie. One must keep his friends close, Raziel, and his enemies even closer. First up is Soul Reaver 2 for the PlayStation 2. Now, confusingly, this is actually the third in the series that sees the main character, Raziel, kicking vampire ass across the strange and twisted world of Nosgolf. <laughs> <laughs> 
This is a PlayStation 2 upgrade. The plot sprawls across 20 hours of gameplay, in which Raziel discovers why he's responsible for both the destruction and the salvation of his much-loved homeland. But what, what, what do our moaning jurors think? I thought Soul Reaver 2 was a very good game. I have to admit, I didn't play the first one, but I'm quite tempted to go back and give it a try. The graphics in this game are fantastic. I was a big fan of the first game. Huge, big, dark environments. In PS2, they're even better. They blew me away. The Soul Reaver world is beautiful. The graphics are fantastic. And my favourite bit is when you get to warp from the normal world to the gnarled spectral world. Next is Vampire Night for the PS2. Forget your garlic, your wooden crucifixes and your steaks. And instead, break out your gun con light gun for this steak em up. I meant to say shoot em up. We're here at last. Yes. How long I've waited for this moment. This game is from the makers of the House of the Dead series. It seems that you have to kill everyone that doesn't look quite right. But in fact, you can save some lucky humans if you're a good shot. The best thing about Vampire Night is the sheer pick-up and play factor. Your mates come round, get the game in, get the gun out, have a blast. Well, it's not just shooting as fast as you can. There's a bit of a strategy. There are some people that have growths on their heads and you have to shoot these off. I love the fact this game is just like a Japanese manga cartoon. It's like watching the cartoon and shooting the bad guys. What more fun do you want? I thought I wouldn't make it. Thank you. Out now for the PC, Gothic. Developed by Piranha Bytes, it boasts an array of 250 non-player characters that are fully interactive. You progress through the game by fighting monsters and solving riddles. How original. Where do you think you're going? With this game, you have to play it for months and months and months to get any reward. You can't just pick it up and expect instant gratification. You have to invest a lot of time in this game. If your idea of fun is wandering about talking to a lot of people, you'll like this game. I personally like Shadow Moon Dreamcast, so this is really my kind of thing. Well, you don't have to have thick black eye makeup and stripy tights to like this game. I think anybody would like it. It's a classic role playing game. Ask my friend Drax here. He knows more about these things than anyone. So there we have it. In third place, with a stake through the heart, it's gothic. In second place, with just a clove of garlic to rub around its plums, it's vampire night. But this week's winner, getting to turn a beautiful young virgin into a member of the undead, it's Soul Reaver 2. Ah. It's break time. Don't sit there crying like a baby. Why not enter our competition to win a Sean Palmer game and a snowboard? Give us a call on 0900 10 200 40 and answer one hilarious question. Calls cost 60p in the line shot on Sunday night, and the winners will have the indignity of having their names broadcast on our Thumb Bandits website. www.channel4.com slash thumbbandits. Turn us after the break. Now, convention dictates that at this point we say... Welcome back to part two. But just to show how unconventional we are, I'm going to tell you what happens in the rest of the show. We get all nostalgic about old-fashioned home computer games. Alex plays Maximo on the PS2, and we have some absolutely hilarious visual gags with those lovely little robot dogs. But before we do all that, we're going to take a look at the top five PlayStation 2 games from last year. Onimusha Warlords, the exclusive PlayStation 2 title, has fought its way to the number five spot. With some of the best cutscenes and FMVs around, inspired by the films of Akira Kurosawa, Onimusha tells the story of 16th century feudal Japan. The fourth best-selling PS2 game of last year is Tekken Tag Tournament. For the first time in the Smash series, you can gang up on your foes with a bit of high-five hand slapping. Now you can settle scores with three other friends or team up against the console. Giving us a flyby at number three is Star Wars Starfighter. Essentially a flight sim in space, Starfighter is the first of the LucasArts license to be brought to the PS2. EA must have been dreaming of a white Christmas with SSX Snowboard Supercross coming in at number two. Almost as preposterous as the sport it's based on, the locations for SSX vary from an iceberg in the South Pacific, the Aloha Ice Jam, to the indoor snow-covered pinball machine arena, the Tokyo Megaplex. But in the number one position is, of course, Gran Turismo 3, a spec. GT3 broke all first week sales records when it careered onto the shelves earlier this year, and it's easy to see why. Choose from more than 150 authentic world-class automobiles, tackle 18 courses including two new tracks, Monte Carlo and the Tokyo Race Circuit. Freedom, freedom, 
Most of the kids in my school had ZX Spectrums. They were like the Ford Escort of home computers. Loads of games and dead cheap. But a lot of parents weren't that happy about their kids playing computer games to them. It was like them glue sniffing or head banging. But one thing that adults generally agreed on was a computer that was educational would be a good thing. Cue the BBC Micro. And this is its story. The BBC had a TV series called The Computer Programme. Very clever, you see. But they needed a machine for it. So the corporation drew up its requirements, then sat back and waited. And finally, along came a small company called Acorn. It made appearances on Tomorrow's World, The Adventure Game, Doctor Who, for which it also provided some of the graphics and special effects, and had an entire series based around it, including making the most of Micro, Micro Live, and Computers in Control. And if that wasn't enough to convince middle-class parents, the BBC also became the official computers that schools used. The BBC Micro had sprite graphics, which means a lot of the games looked a bit shit even at the time. Let me explain what sprites were. If we imagine that this gorgeous Danish pastry is a, a character, and on a spectrum this would be just one sprite. If we assume that this cheese grater is also, I don't know, a castle or something, and it's also a sprite graphic on a spectrum, these two graphics will be able to pass in front of each other, behind each other, without causing any interference. On a BBC, because each image is made up of tiny, tiny pixels, they can't actually go in front or behind each other. So they have to pass through each other. Sort of a bit like this, really. As you can see, that's a bit messy, isn't it? Still, you could get decent titles like Chucky Egg, Castle Quest, Citadel, and its finest hour, Elite. Having passed your interstellar pilot's exams, you're supplied with the Cobra Mark III trading and combat craft. The aim of the game was to trade your way to a fortune and to kill anyone who gets in your way. Just the thing for 1980s teenagers. This sold over a million, but the BBC and Acorn became synonymous with education, and we all know that is not cool for the kids. Model B was replaced by the Master and the Archimedes, but really its days were numbered, because the Nintendo Entertainment System was just around the virtual corner. Nostalgia, where would we be without it? Everybody's getting in on the act, from films, fashion, television, and computer games. Well, they're the worst culprits. Most of the old ones look crap now, and instead of being brave and coming up with new genius ideas, developers are simply recycling old classics, like Maximo for the PlayStation 2. It's borrowed from Capcom's original arcade hits, Ghouls and Ghosts. You get the gist, you've got to thwack the undead with a variety of weapons across 30 engaging and interactive environments. You are Maximo, a young monarch who returns from war to discover that your kingdom has been appropriated by Achilles, the bad guy, who marries your sweetheart and then murders you. So, contrary to modern gameplay convention, you start out dead and have to end up alive. Your mission is to stop Achilles from raising evil beings from the afterworld to serve as his army of minions. Your evil dead foes are event triggered, which means that you can watch them wait for you to cross an invisible line before they hobble over and try to attack you. They're not the smartest enemies I've ever been up against. But most irritating of all is that it's extremely linear. With all this beauty around, I just want to explore my surroundings. Look behind the nearest gravestone. Peer over the closest cliff. Pop down the adjoining hallway? I wanted to find an alternative route, but I was thwarted by level design, obstacles, and bad camera. Still, it's the little touches that save Maximo. He sports red heart boxer shorts, there are 40 lovely power-ups, and the music is nice. Maximo passes the time. It's not offensive, it doesn't smell bad, and if you get it as a gift, don't throw a temper tantrum and chuck it against the wall. But do trade it in for Jack and Daxter, and try and live in the now. The old days weren't all that great. Maximo is available to buy on the 15th of February. It's now the year 2002, and quite frankly, there aren't enough cool inventions around. There's no time travel, there's no hovering cars, and there's no uneasy friendship with a neighboring planet. But one gadget straight out of Buck Rogers is the Cyberdog. Sony's Ivo range comes in three flavors. This is the catchily named ERS-220. This is the ERS-210. And this is the more cuddly LM series. Walk forward. Now, 
Originally, I wanted a pit bull to go with my big, tough TV image. But then I heard about the benefits of having one of these robotic bitches. These cyber dogs have a range of abilities that make them smarter than your average mutt. They can receive email, mix a martini, order a curry, and spend six years indoors without trying to hump your leg. The LM series comes in macaron and latte, which to you and me means black and white. Now, you can tell him he's a good dog and pet him by pulling his head forward and to scold him by pulling his head back. He's also got a voice recognition and imitation function. He's very cute, and Sony are describing him more high touch than high tech. Nice. His recommended retail price is £720, including VAT. This tough-looking fella is the top of the range, the mutts nuts, if you will. Thanks very much. It's got more light and voice sensors, and it growls like a mofo. The ERS-220 and ERS-210 are similar, but the more aggressive and more advanced 220 comes in at £1,270. Getting down to the nitty-gritty, I can tell you that to maximise these dogs' potential, you need to invest more than the purchase price. Additional functions come in the guise of the Ivo Thumb Pack, Ivo Master Studio, Ivo Messenger and Ivo Navigator Packs. Buy all that, plus the wireless LAN cards and optional joystick, and you can expect to stump up to £2,168. The memory stick allows voice recognition, and when it's programmed, it can even respond to its own name. You can also record messages in the form of WAV files. Help me, Obi-Wan, you're my only hope. These babies come in gold, silver and black, and they are totally PC. That doesn't mean they don't swear like troopers, but they don't talk to Macintosh. Last year, some 170 games were released for the PlayStation 2. That's a lot of titles. Some of them were good, some of them were absolute cack. But what about next year? What will we see then? That is amazing. MotoGP for the Xbox focuses on simulation, not coin-op accessibility. Using a game engine developed by Climax's specialist motorsports team, the handling looks to be more sophisticated, and the power of the Xbox certainly adds a bit of fairy dust to the graphics. A particularly nice touch is the motion blur you get when maxing out on the speed. You get to race at 10 of the most popular courses in the world with access to all the current list of speed freaks in the Grand Prix. Apart from the careers mode, there are further five modes, including an arcade mode and an adrenaline-pumping four-player split-screen mode. Perhaps the most bizarre and certainly the most addictive game to come out in the next couple of months is Super Monkey Ball on the next generation Nintendo. Early reports say that this is the GameCube's golden launch title. There are 110 levels, but the real fun starts when you access the three new game modes, Monkey Race, Monkey Fight, and Monkey Target. The coolest thing about these gamettes is that they could be realized as self-contained releases in their own right. Jetset Radio's unique look has spawned a whole host of copycat games. From Sega's Sonic Shuffle to Nintendo's new Zelda game. And here's a sneaky peek at the latest, it's cell damage on the Xbox. Don't be so irritating. <laughs> cell damage is a cartoon style driving beat-em-up. Your car will swing from vines, deliver a sucker punch with a boxing glove and bounce off cobwebs. This game looks like it should be a piece of piss, a walk in the park, a party game to have a few laughs with, but it's as difficult as hell. Whilst I'm making my way around the track, why don't you make your way to our website at www.channel4.com forward slash thumbbandits. On next week's show, we get the lowdown on the chunkiest console there is, the Xbox. We review Halo, a whole brace of sports games, and continue the history of video gaming with Sega vs Nintendo, Battle of the Consoles. Ciao. Arrivederci. Right, Sammy, make me coffee, read my email, then check... Fuck. There we go, this is Now, convention dictates that at this point we say... Welcome back to part two. <coughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Certainly the most addictive game to come out in the next couple of months is... Between one or six points of beer, sir, which means you're quite ready. Uh, oh, fucking hell. Sorry, I was adding too many words. Find good help these days. It means that the... Day Ooh, fucking hell. From Sega's Sonic Car. And if you get it as a gift, don't throw a temper tantrum and trick it. Mm. <laughs> Sorry.